Welcome to the first MP Cafe of this semester, and for many of us, our first MP Cafe ever. To begin with, we're gonna call our one and only red-haired friend, who's gonna try to define mind. Let's welcome Eileen. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to present what is mind. And as I was thinking about this question, I was driving, <laughs> and I heard this song that is at the background playing. And I immediately connected the lyrics to what is mind. I identified many aspects that we talked in class that I wanted to highlight first. So, I'll first put. Okay, so this song has many parts. And uh, the first parts I noticed were the ones that we normally see as mysterious or a little bit unknown. Um, and the first part it mentions crying, being surprised, and the doubts that complicate the mind. Um, so I'll explain each keyword later. Uh, uh, the second part, I also connected it with something that sometimes we think it's a sign of weakness. Um, and, that, and something that maybe we wouldn't know what to do uh, with the strength it gives us anyway. And I connected it to the unconscious. We normally think of the unconscious as something that limits us because we can't really control it. Uh, but really, we saw that it gives, gives us an opportunity of freedom. Um, and maybe if we were conscious of everything, we wouldn't know what to do with that strength anyway. It would be super overwhelming. Um, I also identified habits with Barbara Oakley. We, we saw that it ha had a direct connection with mind. Um, distorting the facts as memory, uh, that we don't remember everything the same. Looking forward and turning back, our awareness of time and space. Um, and the last part about dreams and creativity and how the, at night our, our mind is in charge of uh, untying all the information that we got uh, during the day, like Penelope. She unweaved every night uh, the, her knitting. Um, and also we washed the palette clean. It made me think of creativity and imagination. Um, and there's this voice inside us um, that we don't know if it's something else or if it is us, and it's also connected to the mind. And also, whatever we deny or embrace, uh, it shows that we can choose. Uh, we can make decisions that will lead us to something else. So there's this connection of the known and the known, and things that, makes us hum that make us human. Uh, suffering, being surprised, uh, expecting, um, I don't know what to say, the sense of I, self-awareness, self-reflection, distorting the facts, also can be connected with lying, as Odysseus does, looking forward, as planning, uh, turning back, as remembering, reflection, wash the palette clean, as I mentioned, imagination and creativity, and also the important aspect of caring. Uh, we are humans and we can uh, empathize with others. We can see beyond what is obvious. Uh, but it all comes down to whatever we deny or embrace. And I'm running a little bit out of time, but I wanted to mention that uh, Odysseus is the perfect example of a human who encompasses all of these uh, suffering, worrying, lying, and the knowledge of death and he incorporates it in order to change and add quality to, to his life. So mind is this complex system that incorporates the mystery of reality and the world that we know. Our free will, creativity, wit, self-awareness, and more amazing stuff reside in the mind. And I wanted to end with a poem I made that connects death, mind, and living as a human being. And it starts with a phrase we saw in class. Wisdom is knowing how to age. A thought-provoking phrase. Daily wandering, I know, 
when life unauthorized takes the stage. Daily wandering about each decision, when not even memory endows me with such precision. Yet, each script leads to a new alternative, and death ceases to be a threatening imperative. The causes of awareness come, of aging and dying, come with the benefits of creating. The stage has revealed its gift, liberty with knowledge so swift. I take it as I embrace my humanness, and having lived with its quality, I embrace the last scene's kiss. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. That was a wonderful presentation. Now we are going to, well, one of our new book campers is going to present his approach on the question, what is mind? Let's welcome Harry. Today I'm going to present an analysis on what is mind based on the book written by Homer, The Odyssey. This book narrates the story of King Odysseus and his return back to Ithaca, his kingdom. I will be analyzing three books. Book 9, which is the book where, where they meet the Cyclops, Book 11, which is his trip to, to the underworld, and Book 13, which is his return to Ithaca. So I would like to start my presentation with this quote. If you don't know where you are going, any road will take you there, by Lewis Carroll. Now let's jump to Book 9, and let's fast forward to the scene where Odysseus is escaping from the Cyclops. He, we can see here that Odysseus is not happy with the fact that they escaped the Cyclops, but instead he decides to shout back his name in a proud way and let the Cyclops know who was the brave and great warrior who blinded him. This little moment of pride for our character will come at a great cost to enwrath Poseidon, who is the father of Polythemus, and who will make his trip back home almost impossible. So, by this scene, we can notice that Odysseus is a really proud man, has a deficit to control his emotion, lacks the capacity of thinking on the long run, and is incapable of thinking about others than himself. This last thing we can infer by the fact that she's, that he's screaming back to the Cyclops and endangering his men because the Cyclops is throwing rocks at them. So this is the Odysseus we get to know in the first half of the book. So now let's jump to book 13. In this book, we find Odysseus in a shore, completely lost. He doesn't know where he is. And he, in the distance, sees a little shepherd. He approaches the little shepherd and asks him if he can tell him where they are at. The little shepherd replies and says they are in Ithaca. When Odysseus hears this, he is blown away in joy and really happy to be back home. But he manages his, his emotions not to show his joy. And in reply, he says, oh, Ithaca, I've heard of it. To which then the little shepherd replies, who are you and where do you come from? Then Odysseus proceeds to tell this long, made up and completely false story about him coming from Crete and being completely someone else. Suddenly, the little shepherd reveals his real identity. It was Athena in disguise. And Athena congratulates Odysseus and, tell, and tells him that she is really proud of him because he is now able to manage his emotions, to not give up his character and continue with the plan on killing the suitors and getting back to his wife and son. So what made this big change in our main character? The short answer is the trip to the underworld. In the underworld, there is, um, Odysseus speaks with Tiresias. And Tiresias tells him that the only way his men and he can make him back to Ithaca is, is if they learn how to control themselves. He also sees his mother in the underworld and finds out that her mother is dead. They are able to have a little chat and in this little interaction, the mother narrates, Odysseus' mother narrates how she died from pain of, for waiting for him and how much pain she was for not knowing anything about his beloved son. It doesn't say it explicitly in the book, but we can infer that this, is, this experience hit him hard, made him realize how much pain his absence had caused to his loved ones. And also this experience gave him a certainty and a clear direction to get back to his son and to his wife. So where am I going with all this compare and contrast? What is mine for me? Well, mine for me is the capacity humans have for eudaimonia, which best translates to English as human flourishing. In other words, uh, the capacity we have to self-reflect and reason about our past mistakes to grow and to make a change that will lead us towards a desired outcome. Thank you. 
Thank you, Javi. That approach on the Odyssey and what is mine was incredible. Now, we're gonna present someone that hopes that you are here today because of a decision you made. Because we make decisions every day, don't you think? Let's welcome Jose, who's gonna talk about decisions. Decisions. Don't you think that we, like humans, we make decisions every day, we make good decisions, bad decisions, and even ugly decisions. Making decisions is part of our everyday life. But what we can do with that? It is good to have so many. Well, spoiler, spoiler alert, I will say yes, but not only me. Someone that also will say yes is Joaquin and Fuster. In all these meta questions, we read the neuroscience of freedom and creativity. And something that Fuster say in introduction really touched my heart and is the, are these two quotes. The richer the past experience, the broader is the distribution of cognates in brain space. And thus, the greater is the number of the available, available options and the greater, the greater the freedom to select among them. And the second one, there, therein lies our cortex, potential for learning from the past and for shaping the future. And therein, therein lies the potential for freedom, which is ours. So when I read this, I was like, this makes a lot of sense. We make decisions based on our past or the things that we know. So to make an example for this, I make a little graph the infinite possibilities and choices. So something mundane, like you want to eat something, we have a lot of decisions to make, making this decision. Like when, what do you want to do, order food or cook? If you want to order food, you have more decisions in which have you're gonna order, Pedos Ya, Uber Eats, Hugo, Globo, rest in peace, Globo, I really love Globo. It's the only thing that San Lucas have in the moment. But if you want to cook something, what do you want to do? You want to make something that you already knew, like pollo, bistec or something else, or try and break your pattern of everyday life and make something new that you didn't know how to do, like pizza, pasta, or something more. But this is not only, we, we can make this decision because we know the experience of ordering food, we know the, the experience of cooking something, but like a little chi child, like five years old, that only know about the food that are made in home, what is gonna be his experience when he goes through a McDonald's or a Burger King? He's gonna be like, this is a hamburger. I never tried a hamburger. This is the best thing I ever had. But this change that we make in everyday life to get something that we know we don't know and make it new, make experience based in that, make us more capable of making good decisions. But it's not flowers and roses with these type of things. This cap capacity of making decisions and forging our future have pros and cons. This process can be always something new in the horizon. We can always learn something new. We can always try something new. So this capacity of making new choices based on past choices is good. We can forge our future. I can maybe make a course of, I don't know, maths because I like maths now because I don't feel the maths so wrong when I was in third grade or something. And we can learn from the past. This is the most important part for me because the past is always there. We can't escape from the past. So learn from the past is something that we have to do every day. But these have cons, obviously. The first one is anxiety. So sometimes when you have all these choices or like making a simple call to order food because you don't have Wi-Fi, it's like, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I want to order like a pollo campero or a McDonald's. I don't want if I a big tasty, a, a Big Mac. So this can make anxiety. And because we live in a society, society, we live in a society and all the people are making choices, we feel, we feel lost because we think that the choices that we, are that we are making are not the right choices to the moment of to engage with the group. And the last one is something, sometimes not learning or repeating the same mistakes. I have this problem again and again that I try to study math, but I get distracted. So I say, I'm gonna study math harder, but I always get distracted. So I, really not I am not learning from the past because I am the making the same mistake. But it's fine ma making the same mistakes one, two times, but the third time is our fault because we can see the past. We, I am, we are not blind to see our mistakes. So yeah, I'm not talking about decisions. I'm not talking about this power, but what about mine? So here's my answer. Mine for me is like a toolbox. In this toolbox, we have different tools. We have, I don't know, the memories, the concept of our time more and more. But these tools need to be, take, we, we need to take care of these tools because we can't cut wood with a, pizza, a pickaxe or chop something with a pickaxe, I don't know. So with this concept of mine, 
I remember about the, the song, Dream On, about Aerosmith. So this song talks about of keep dreaming and dreaming. So an important part for me in this toolbox is that we can dream on and learning from the past and the freedom that we have from our past for learning from the past and making new decisions, we can make a better future every day. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. We do make a lot of decisions. Thank you for presenting that. Now, we have not one, but two beautiful book campers who are going to be telling the story of two different stories that connect. Let's welcome Kami and Analu. I wanted to start this presentation by telling a story, a short story of for a journey throughout the meta question. I can start saying that at the beginning, this was very scary trying to define what is mine feels like a very big question. And throughout our journey, I can now say that I don't know if it's really important to know what mind is, but I found more interesting the different approach of each author and what it said about the author and their answers. And well, for me, I was pretty excited because I knew that we were going to have new boot campers, right? Um, and then talking about the books, uh, for me, it was a little difficult to create some connections there, but I think we just made something here. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to start, uh, well, talking about a storytelling movie. We're going to be talking about the fish and big spoiler alert. Um, if you haven't seen it, we are very sorry to say that we will be telling you the end. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have Edward Bloom, that is the father. And we have William, who is the son. Uh, Edward tells real stories about his life, but he adds a plot twist to them. And William has been listening to these stories throughout his entire life, and he no longer knows if he enjoys the plot twist. And, well, they both grow, right? Uh, and this is a spoiler, the dad is really sick. So now we know our main characters, now we have to know our main definitions, our main words. We have the external world, which is everything that is outside, what is surrounding us, is a very objective kind of world, and it's what we would see as fact. And here we have the internal world that is more involved with feelings, emotions, sensations. It's more abstract, um, and it also involves perception. Right, And here in the middle, we have the mind, which is the interpreter that understands one of these worlds and translates it into the other. It tries to communicate onto the other. Now, back to the movie. Um, throughout the movie, we get to know um, Edward's life through the stories that he's telling. And these are not regular stories because we have witches and we have giants and we have werewolves. Sometimes time stops and then it fasts forward. And it's, it doesn't feel real. And well, here this creates a conflict within the relation of Will and Edward, right? Because the son, Will, really wants to know what are the facts, what is real. Who is his dad, right? And throughout the movie, we ask ourselves the same thing because we don't know. We are also concerned with the fact of where the man starts and where the myth starts. Here we have a scene of the movie. Uh, here we have a wheel that is going upstairs. The first picture that is here is one of him as a child, and then the last one is him as a grown-up, right? We can see his face through the first steps that he is taking, and he's really happy remembering all these stories that his father told him, until he gets to the last step, and then he sees a picture of him as a grown-up, and his face changes. When he was a child, he didn't care who was the man 
and what was the myth until he grew up. He, he wanted to, to create the separation between those two. And there is a moment in the movie where this concern is expressed between Edward and Will. So, here. What do you want, Will? Who do you want me to be? Yourself. Good, bad, everything. Just show me who you are for once. I have been nothing but myself since the day I was born. And if you don't see that, it's your feeling, not mine. And well, we see that Ed tries to explain himself to Will, and Will doesn't understand. Will no longer understands the stories. But what is the real story? This is the big question. We can see that Edward understands the external world with a more mythological and, well, abstract way, right? Because he is adding all these magical creatures. He's more in touch with his internal world. And Will, when he is this Will, he is a lot more object objective, he's focused on the fact, and he is obsessed with getting to know who the man is and to differentiate it with, with the myth in the stories. For the last scene. This is a big spoiler, he dies, but well, well <laughs> we can see here uh, one of the final scenes. Uh, we have Edward, he's in the hospital, lonely. He's not even in a private room. It's uncomfortable. And none of his friends from his stories knows that he is there dying. His external world is sad and depressing. <laughs> The only person that is there is Will, his son, and Ed asks him to tell him one last story, the story of how he goes, of how he's going to die. And Will goes on and tells this very fantastical story where Ed is no longer lonely, he's no longer uncomfortable, he is being received by everyone who knew him, everyone who loved him, everyone who has been part of his life, they're cheering up for him, they're smiling, there's music, there's a cheering squad. And it's a very nice thing. It's very happy, a very nice moment. And this, this is how he goes. It's not about the story. It's about who is telling the story. Throughout the movie, we not only follow uh, Ed's journey throughout his life, but also Will who is trying to make this distinction. He is hang, having the problem of the iceberg, as he says, that he only knows what's above the water and he wants to know what's under the water. And up until this point at the ending scene, he realizes that just by knowing what's here, he gets to know what is here because it is the same thing. We're talking about the same. And well, since from one you can get to know the other, right? Because we're talking about the same thing as you said. We're talking about Edward Bloom. And just as him told his stories of his life to his son, his son will later told his stories to his son, but not only them, his friends, the people that knew Edward were talking about Edward Bloom. They were talking about his stories. Those stories are a projection of the author. It's a translation, an interpretation of the inner world of the person into the exterior world. What about the mind? Well, <laughs> again, to definitions and or final conclusion. Uh, here, the mind would be a connection within the external world and the internal world. It interpretates what is happening outside and it internalizes it. And by telling stories, we can notice that this bridge here not only goes that way, but it goes both ways because we can take what we have on the inside and we can express it to the outside world. Storytelling. If written is the immortality of the mind. Thank you. Thank you, Kamsen and Alu. That was wonderful. I wasn't able to watch the movie, sadly. <laughs> So it was a big spoiler for me, but whenever I do get to watch it, I'm going to be seeing it with a very cool interpretation. So thank you. Now we're going to receive one of our artist friends. We have many <laughs> who made a collage and a painting. Let's welcome Isa. Today for this meta question, I'm going to present you a collage and a painting. 
The collage is mainly my ideas before studying the mind and the brain. As you can see, we have pieces of pictures and information that doesn't really make sense. That was the ideas I used to have before. Um, I didn't know where they came from or why did I believe them and I didn't have any base or question beyond what I thought I mind was. So after studying what mind is, I came up with this. This is a lot more organized even if it doesn't seem like it is organized. Um, this is an acrylic painting um, and as you can see, I hope it's a self-portrait. <laughs> um, for me, doing a self-portrait is being really connected with the topic of the painting. So I think it was important to connect with the question, what is mind? So as you can see, my eyes are blank and that represents that we cannot see the mind. We cannot touch it. This is not something material. And it depends on the painting, uh, the meaning of the blank eyes. So, you know, here it's the mind is not something we can see. Um, you also can see that my head is open. Um, that's because all this question revolves around the head, uh, around the mind and the, and the brain. So it's like op opening a box and seeing what's in inside and what's going on there and questioning really what I have inside my head. Um, so as you can see also, I did some abstract here. It's these stains represent the neurons. And I hope you can see that I used some gold paint that represents the connections of those neurons, all the uh, chemicals and electricity they provoke when they are connected. So the background is uh, black. That represents the subconscious. But the fact that it's black doesn't mean that it's necessarily something bad, because it's something that we're not really aware of. Um, and yes, the subconscious is a non-physical place where we store a lot of information about ourselves and where we do things automatically. Like without it, we would be thinking every single thing we do every single day. And the painting itself, the whole also represents consciousness and awareness. Because I knew what I wanted to represent here. I knew how to do it and how to express it. And I was aware of um, my surroundings while I was doing this painting. And I think it's the case for me to mention imagination, since this came out of my mind's imagination. And we cannot see this in real life. So for me, what makes a mind a mind are subconscious, consciousness, imagination, and awareness. Those are the main elements for a mind to be. And in conclusion, uh, also, the main element for a mind to exist is the brain and the cortex. Um, yes, um, the cortex is, is in charge of uh, how we perceive stimuli, stimuli, how we feel the emotions, and it's very important the development of the brain and the cortex for us to uh, develop uh, all the abilities in our minds and have the four elements I mentioned before. And for me, it was a very inspiring question because I, I don't usually do abstract. So I think it was very refreshing for me to mix abstract, something that I'm not used to do, with something that I love doing, that it's the human figure. And I cannot leave a human out of this painting when we're talking about mind. So I'm looking forward to get inspired with the other meta questions and came up with new ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Isa. Your painting and your collage is wonderful. Finally, it's me, I'm the one who, who needs to present right now? The wind. Oh, the wind. That which moves. Dancer of the sun. Lover of the moon. Guardian of the world. Honey on a spoon. A mother for those who cry on the grassland. A friend for those who lay on the dry sand. In the spring to move the breeze in the fall, to move the trees. It never ends, 
for it never starts, but moves forever in the hearts. To grow a dream, to build a mind. In the paper airplane, you are yet to find. Extraordinary, but never strange, and bound to be in never constant change. Good morning, my name is Matias Estrada, and today I'll be presenting or explaining briefly my essay, The Winds of the Brain, to describe a non-corporeal subject. In the moving sculpture we're watching, creating by Daniel Wurzel, we can find a perfect representation, well, a visual representation on the subject matter, the mind. Hayek, in the sensory order, page 48, describes the mind as a machine constructed for the purpose of performing simple processes of information. And in Leibniz's monodology, page 150, Leibniz states that the mind are, that the minds are capable of understanding the universe and of imitating something of it, if these imitations are only the ability to produce schematic representations, both of them describing the mind as that which does. For to describe a non-corporeal subject is a complex thing to do. Barbara Oakley, in her course, Learning How to Learn, talks about the brain, which is a corporeal thing. In regard of memory, she says that the brain is like a storage warehouse, and it makes sense. The brain stores information. It is like a library. But what were to happen if this library remained untouched? In the case of these sculptures, if there was no wind, the flying fabrics or sheets would fall on the floor and remain still. Without the wind, they are unable to perform. But what is the wind? The wind is moving air, and the air is nitrogen and oxygen. But we can say that it somehow is non-corporeal, for, for it lacks body. We cannot say the wind is a square, or the wind is green, but we can say, because of its behavior and interaction with the environment, that the wind might be moving to the left, left or moving to the right, or perhaps not moving at all, or we can just say, it's moving. It is one and the same with the mind. It is in the brain, if our stored information remains untouched, living things with brain would remain still. They would be still figures. It is the very neuronal interaction, which is the interaction between the information stored, that makes a proper living thing. That interaction, is the mind, and their interaction only happens through motion, neuronal motion. Aristotle de describes motion in his book Physics as a change of any kind, as the actuality of a potentiality. Therefore, if the interaction can only happen through motion, and the mind itself is that interaction, then the mind is a motion. The mind is motion on the brain, is the motion that happens in between the neurons. For if that motion didn't exist, then we wouldn't be able to tell uh, patterns on behavior or instant responses, or in the case of the humans, the connections between concepts and the, the ability to create ideas. The mind is like winds in the brain. Thank you very much. I also want to thank you all for being here for our first MP Cafe. I think we have done all of a pretty good job. I really enjoyed your presentations. I hope you enjoyed mine. So thank you very much.